Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here from Wedgwood Pharmacy. My name is Megan Abbott, and uh, we have a wonderful special guest here today. I have Dr. Pedro Dominguez. Um, he's here from Pompano Veterinary Oncology. Um, and uh, Dr. Dominguez, before we get started, can you give uh, the audience here a, an introduction of who you are and, and what you do at your practice? Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Pedro Dominguez. Um, I am uh, double boarded in medical and radiation oncology for small animals. Uh, currently, I have my practice called Pompano Veterinary Oncology, where we provide medical oncology services in clinic and mobile services for pets. Um, excited to be here with Wetwood Pharmacy, uh, recording some uh, commonly asked questions from our pet owners uh, when their pets are diagnosed with cancer. Fantastic. So uh, here at Wedgwood Pharmacy, we approached uh, Dr. Dominguez uh, to ask him, what are the common questions uh, that he gets asked as a veterinary oncologist? Uh, so Dr. Dro, as I'm going to be calling him from here on out, uh, was kind enough to, to compile that for us. Um, and we're going to go through those together right now. Uh, so Dr. Dro, uh, first question uh, that you get asked uh, most often as a veterinary oncologist is, why does my pet have cancer? Well, Megan, you know, that's uh, one of the very common questions we get uh, in our initial consultations with pet owners once their pets get diagnosed with cancer. Uh, as you might expect, it's kind of a stressful situation for them. Um, most pet owners want to make sure that it's nothing that they have done uh, to cause the cancer in their pets. Um, again, we understand, we try to explain uh, as much as possible, uh, again, why their pet uh, gets cancer. Uh, and it's usually nothing that pet owners have done uh, or, or that they have not done, uh, which is also something that they're always concerned about. Um, you know, cancer, it's a very complex disease. Certainly pets mimic what happens in humans. Uh, and again, when it's a complex disease, cancer is a disease of the, what is called the genome, meaning it's at the DNA level. Uh, so in other words, we usually say pets, just like humans, are born with certain genes and they are predisposed to developing cancers. That being said, uh, because their lifespan is usually shorter than in the human uh, counterparts, uh, certainly there are things that are manifested usually faster. There are factors that may affect those genes in the pets that affects their DNA, like environmental factors, certainly aging uh, or exposure uh, to things in the environment that may trigger certain changes in the pet's DNA that then causes cancer. There are some breeds that are more predisposed than others. Certainly larger breed dogs are more predisposed to the aggressive type of cancer. So um, and that's something that we really have no clear explanation for. Uh, certainly their lifespan is shorter. So these diseases, um, because of the genetic environmental components are manifested faster. Uh, that being said, unfortunately, uh, cancer is the most common cause of death of pets over the age of seven. Um, so certainly an aggressive type of disease, we don't have clear cut answers, but we know that genetic factors and environmental factors do play a role in the development of cancer in pets. Wow, it's fascinating. And um, and it's really nice too that there's, you know, every year's um, new advancements, new research um, into understanding, um, you know, the, the, the genomes and so. And, and I can add something to that where nowadays there's also, because the technology has been developed, there are, uh, early detection tests that are being developed uh, that can be used to detect cancer, not necessarily prevent it, but certainly detect them earlier. Uh, so hopefully find better treatments and better outcome once these pets are treated with cancer. Oh, that's amazing. Early intervention, that's fantastic. Great, okay. Um, so our next question, how did my pet get cancer? How did your pet get cancer? Uh, well, cancer, again, like I explained, it's a complex disease. Uh, certainly, there's no way of predicting which pets, just like humans, are going to get cancer. It is estimated that usually about one in three pets, just like in people, 
are going to get cancer, estimated overall in the United States, about six to seven million pets are diagnosed with cancer every year. So how did your pet get cancer? Again, your pet probably was born with certain gene, uh, a gene that could have been defective or a gene that could have predisposed that pet to cancer. Over its lifetime, it acquires defects in that gene, defects in the DNA, what we call mutations. And it only takes one cancer cell to acquire that mutation. That cancer cell then acquires an aggressive behavior, making it either a tumor or a cancer itself. That being said, it's not like cancer picks your pet. It's still a random risk. We cannot predict out of a litter of maybe seven or eight puppies, which one is going to develop cancer in the future. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Our, our next question. Um, uh, this is a fantastic question too. Uh, we loved this uh, when we got this. Um, is my pet's cancer contagious or is it contagious to me? Uh, most cancers in pets are not contagious. And the reason for that is because most cancers in pets are not caused by an infectious agent like a virus or bacteria or something that can be transmitted through uh, you know, nasal contacts or uh, any other type of contact that it may have. There is one cancer called transmissible venereal tumor uh, that can be transmitted from one dog to the other because of close contact. In cats, there's the feline leukemia virus, which can certainly predispose cats to developing lymphoma, and the virus itself can be transmitted from one cat to the other. But once they develop the cancer, the cancer itself cannot be transmitted to another uh, cat. Okay. That being said, the majority of the cancers are not contagious from one animal to the other. They're certainly not contagious from animals to people. There are no known cancers transmitted from people to animals or from animals to people. Um, they are usually what we call species specific. So again, a dog gets lymphoma and the owner gets lymphoma. It doesn't mean that the cancer was transmitted uh, from the owner to the pet. It just unfortunately, randomly, that pet may have gotten lymphoma and the owner may have gotten lymphoma itself. But in terms of being contagious, no. No. Good. I mean, that's, you know, uh, something to just reassure, because again, it's it's a, you know, we were talking before we started recording today, is this, this is a fragile time in a pet owner's life. So uh, we want to make sure that everybody's, um, you know, emotional health is is taken care of. Absolutely. I mean, the, the important thing here is the human animal bond, right? So we're always touching, petting our pets, and, and we want to make sure that, uh, again, nothing that we're doing or that we're not transmitting, sometimes multiple pet households, we're always concerned that if one pet has it, that the other one doesn't get it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. What kind of treatment is available for my pet with cancer? Um, that's a very, uh, good question. Obviously, Big question. Yeah, it, 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 it's a question that we can be talking for hours about, uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, for, for purposes of, of time and, and keeping it broad. Um, th the simple answer is it depends on the type of tumor and the stage of the disease. You know, uh, there are options, uh, for tumors that are localized and options like surgery and radiation. Um, there are tumors that can spread to other parts of the body or that present themselves as a systemic disease. Most mm -hmm. common that we see is lymphoma yes. and the treatment is usually chemotherapy. There are tumors that respond to immunotherapy where we're not necessarily targeting the tumor. We're trying to manipulate the pet's immune system to attack the cancer itself. Uh, and there has been a lot of advances in terms of the development of newer drugs targeted therapies, uh, we call them molecular or receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, small molecular inhibitors, or specific drugs that target one specific uh, uh, abnormality of the tumor to control the disease itself. Um, so again, it depends mostly on what type of tumor we're dealing with, uh, the state of the pet, 
uh, obviously we, we do care about quality of life. So again, that makes us determine what's the best option for that pet uh, at the moment and at the stage of disease. Just because surgery is an option doesn't mean every patient can have surgery because of the anesthetic risk or potential complications of surgery. So, uh, you know, I think that's where Wedgwood comes in and has helped a lot in terms of uh, compounding drugs to dosages that we can accurately and safely use in our pets uh, to kind of treat cancer uh, without using the human uh, available dosage forms that are in the pharmacy or in uh, uh, regular uh, formulations. That's very difficult uh, because there's, you know, the commercially available medications are not one size fits all. Um, and they're very dangerous to try to split, right? To, to, to get uh, what we would think the necessary dose would be for, you know, certain animals. Um, for the accurate dosing. The exactly. accurate dosing, again, splitting a tablet or breaking a capsule, uh, certainly makes it, makes it difficult to accurately uh, dose patients, especially smaller patients. Uh, and again, we certainly don't want to cause adverse effects or side effects of these medications. That's always one of the main concerns for the pet owners and the oncologist itself. Uh, so certainly uh, th the fact that we can formulate uh, the drugs that we want to specific dosages makes it uh, better for us in terms of treating these patients, not just in the short term, but also long term. Completely agree. And, you know, in the benefits of compounding, um, you know, they, they even expand to, um, you know, we can do a flavored dosage form, um, something to uh, entice, help increase compliance, um, take that stress away from having to give medication and such a serious medication. Um, so we're, we're just really proud that here at, you know, Wedgwood that we're able to provide um, compounding services like that, uh, just to, you know, really help you and what you do um, uh, with treating these animals. That's perfect. Awesome. I like peanut butter. So again, I like medication <laughs> flavor like peanut butter, but uh, obviously pets like chicken, tuna, you know, and there are different types of flavors that can be made that definitely makes the compliance much higher. We have some really interesting flavors of cheddar cheese. Um, it smells like feet. Um, you can <laughs> actually go on our um, TikTok and see one of our one of our employees taste testing some of our flavorings. Um, really fun. <laughs> hey, my dog licked my feet once in a while, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, Dr. Dro. Um, our final question today um, is: What kind of diet changes do I need to make? Uh, diet changes. Um, this is a very common question. Uh, and usually this is kind of a repeated question we get um, depending on the patient. Um, th the short answer is usually there are no dietary changes that need to be made once pets are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, there are some patients, and again, as you might expect, older patients or patients that may come in already with predisposing conditions like food allergies. Uh, that they may need special diets. Um, those patients certainly, the more consistent they remain on either the prescription diet or the home cooked diets, um, certainly the better because that doesn't change what we would expect in terms of side effects of medications if they are going to be on medications. Uh, but for the most part, we recommend well-balanced diets. Most of our patients are on commercialized well-balanced diet or home-cooked, well-balanced diets where owners have a specific recipe from either a nutritionist or usually reputable sources as far as home-cooked meals. Um, the, the most important thing, and especially when they are undergoing chemotherapy or undergoing targeted therapy, what we certainly don't want is to start making drastic dietary changes because if they do develop side effects, most common side effects like vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, or the most common is my pet doesn't want to eat his diet anymore. We don't want to make any drastic changes that may cause things that mimic the side effects of the treatment. Right. That way we can determine if the patient is tolerating the treatment or not uh, and make the necessary adjustments.
Um, by the same token, there are dietary supplements uh, that are commercially available nowadays. Um, and again, most of those supplements um, are for either boosting the immune system, gastrointestinal health, uh, same thing. Um, as long as it's consistent uh, with the treatment, as long as dietary or drastic changes aren't made, uh, then usually there's no specific supplements for dietary changes that need to be made for pets with cancer. Fantastic. Yeah, it makes sense. Totally makes sense. I mean, if you think about humans with cancer, right, we still, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uncommon that they're recommended to make dietary changes. Certainly the most important thing for pets is that they consume, that they can eat and have enough caloric intake to maintain normal body function. Uh, the worst thing uh, in terms of dietary changes is that our pets don't eat their food. Uh, and that usually creates more stress, not just for the pet, but certainly creates stress for the pet owner because that's a visual effect. You know, we like seeing our pets eat their food on a daily basis. Um, and so again, those are the common things that we tend to get that we try to manage uh, while the pets are undergoing treatment. Wonderful. Say, you know, Dr. Dro, if if anybody in the audience here perhaps has any questions for uh, you or your practice, do you have um, do you have some social media or contact information you could share with everyone? And we'll we do have social media. Our website is pompanoveterinaryoncology.com, uh, and our social medias are Pompano Veterinary Oncology on Instagram, Pompano Veterinary Oncology on Facebook. Um, certainly our email, uh, general questions, pompanovetonco at gmail.com. Uh, I'm more than glad to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all your time today, um, for your wonderful answers. Um, I learned a lot. I know the audience, uh, certainly has probably learned a lot, um, and, uh, really just appreciate what you do and, you know, what you've brought to us today. No, thank you, Megan. Thank you to Wedgwood Pharmacy for having me. And again, I certainly had fun too. Uh, very interesting uh, in terms of the questions and, and how I can answer them as simple uh, and straightforward for, for pet owners as possible. That sometimes can be, uh, you know, stressful in itself. Uh, but I'm definitely looking forward to answering more questions in the future or any other things that our pet owners with cancer come up with. Uh, so again, thank you, and thank you, Wetwood Pharmacy, and looking forward to many more.